Hello, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Rafael Medina's of the Specialty BMI. Today's of the Specialty is cardiology and most specifically electrophysiology. We have two amazing guests. First, I'll introduce our case presenter, Fran Serpa. He is an MD from Ecuador. He is currently a research fellow in cardiology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. He secured his position through the International Research Initiative Program. In his first year at BIDMC, he was mentored by Dr. Usman Tahir in the Center of Cardiovascular Genetics, which has sparked his interest in electrophysiology. Now, Franz is honored to continue his research fellowship at the Smith Center for Outcomes Research in Cardiology at BIDMC. Working under the mentorship of Dr. Daniel Kramer, his research focuses on health disparities in clinical outcomes related to device-based therapies for arrhythmias. With aspirations of becoming an internist and future cardiologist, Franz is currently applying for an internal medicine residency this cycle. Welcome, Franz. And tell us more about you. Amazing. You'll, you'll do great in this match. Oh, thank you so much for this kind introduction. And, and I'm so happy to be here with all the community um, to present this case. I'm very excited to. Um, well, uh, so you introduced myself. Uh, I think um, just outside of medicine, as, as we were talking about, I think I like to run outside. Um, I also like to play soccer, given my I, I, I lived for a couple of years uh, during my childhood in Brazil. So I think that's where I, I started to be passionate about the, the game. And then, yeah, so that's me. That's amazing. Which is your favorite team? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Barcelona from Spain. I think we have some Real Madrid fans over here. Probably there are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> and now our case is cousin. Dr. Timothy Mar. Dr. Timothy Mar is a staff cardiac electrophysiologist and associate director of BT ablation at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and instruction in medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. His clinical work involves leading a multidisciplinary approach to treating ventricular arrhythmias with a focus on complex BT catheter ablation. His research interests focus on developing and validating innovative electroanatomic mapping techniques to improve the safety and efficacy of BT ablation procedures. He completed his medicine training at Massachusetts General Hospital, and he completed his cardiology and electrophysiology fellowship training at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Welcome, Dr. Marr. We're very, very honored to have you here. And by the way, do you want me to call you Dr. Tim, Dr. Marr? You, you guys can call me Tim. <laughs> Tim, please. Okay, Tim, I will try. Like. Um, what are your favorite things to do in Boston? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, by far, <laughs> my favorite thing to do in Boston is to explore the parks with my dog. I've got a about a year and a half, two year old puppy um, who's got a lot of energy. So I spend all my free time trying to exercise that energy out. Yep. And so oh. there's lots of good parks. My, my favorite's the Arnold Arboretum. If you guys ever have the chance to visit. Definitely, I will definitely go there if I ever go to Boston. And amazing. So we can start with the case of today. Like, I think our scribe. As soon as we share the screen. And yes, as Amanda's mentioned me, we're seeing many new faces today. Welcome, welcome. So you can start, friends. All right, just give me one second. Um, all right, great. Um, I'm gonna start with the case uh, for today. So just as a, as a brief background, uh, this case happened almost a year ago now, in 2022. Uh, it was an, a clinical study in the emergency department. And um, today we're, we're gonna refer to our patient as Mr. M. And in terms of the chief concern, Mr. M is a 63-year-old male with past medical history of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and a cardioverter defibrillator or ICD implant with prior ICD shocks for ventricular tachycardia, who presents to the emergency department after experiencing repeated episodes of syncope and multiple ICD shocks. In terms of his uh, history of present illness, uh, Mr. M has a history of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy diagnosed in 2019 with a dual chamber ICD implanted on 2020 for primary prevention and subsequent appropriate shocks for both ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. The month prior to admission, he had been traveling to visit family in his native El Salvador. While there, he had a syncope event and was found to have had an appropriate shock for ventricular tachycardia on remote ICD monitoring. 
He had another episode a few days later with an IC shock and passed out for a few seconds, leading to a fall with a head laceration and was briefly admitted to the hospital there where his uh, medications were adjusted and he was starting on amiodarone oral load. He was discharged with the plan to return to the US and follow up with, with his primary electrophysiologist and heart failure specialist. He then flew back to the US and contacted the office on arrival, reporting multiple more episodes of brief syncope and painful ICD shots per day. He was then advised to go to the emergency department. So um, in summary, we have a patient with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and ICD implant presented with repeated episodes of syncope and multiple ICD shocks. And at this point, I'd like to just uh, make a pause and, and ask uh, Tim, what would be your approach to this patient? And uh, what would be your, would you be interested in knowing as I continue my case presentation? Thanks, Franz. Well, I'm sorry to hear this gentleman's travels were, were interrupted by, by all of these events. Um, that would be, be very frightening. And so what I want to do with, with the information that you've provided thus far um, in this clinical scenario is to um, help you guys kind of understand some of the frameworks that we use as electrophysiologists to um, uh, do the initial workup and treatment and how we really think about these, these patients. Um, first of all, well, we know, um, just to summarize, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So we know he has a structurally abnormal heart, prior VT and VF, ICD, and he's now having symptomatic episodes. Um, those symptoms including um, syncope. I think you said he had a few episodes of syncope as well as shocks. Um, and so when this person comes in, um, you, you said they were being referred to the ED. When they come into the ED, your first goal always, no matter what the condition, no matter what the specialty is, to make sure the patient's stable, do your a ABCs, the airway, breathing, circulation, make sure they're stable, make sure their blood pressure, um, their current heart rate, everything is, is fine. Um, and you, you want to know what, what rhythm they're currently in. Are they currently having arrhythmias? Um, once you've taken care of that, um, that's typically done by, um, by the emergency room doctors and medicine residents, things like that. And usually by the time we're getting called, um, we, there's a little bit of stability and, and we get called in to, to try to make sense of what's going on to provide assistance in, in the next steps. So the most, um, the key piece of information uh, we will get from this patient is what were these events? And we're really lucky with this patient and that he has a cardiac defibrillator already, an ICD. Um, so well, what can we glean from this information? Well, the electrophysiologist or their technicians can interrogate these devices and we can actually look back to see what these events were. What is the differential diagnosis for a patient presenting with multiple ICD shocks? Um, the differential includes an appropriate shock for something like VT or VF, um, an inappropriate shock, which I'll get into uh, I can get into it in a second, or kind of phantom shocks, or the patient has a has a perception of having a shock, um, often due to a history of prior sh shocks leading to to PTSD, for example. Um, an inappropriate shock refers to when the device defibrillates or, sh or shocks the patient when it was a rhythm that was other than ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. Now that might be an SVT or or atrial fibrillation, um, where the device misinterpreted it as a, um, a ventricular rhythm, um, especially if it's very fast. But single chamber devices, devices that only have one wire in the ventricle, um, have a kind of a limited view of what's going on in the overall electricity of the heart. So sometimes it can be fooled. Um, or there can be a device malfunction. The interrogation will tell you all of this, this information. A device malfunction can lead to noise that's interpreted as an arrhythmia and can lead to shocks. So I would say once you've stabilized the patient and you've, you've contacted the electrophysiology service for help, that's really one of the first things that we would do is, is interrogate that um, defibrillator. So that's not number one. Number two, we would of course wanna get an EKG of what their current um, rhythm is to see if they're still having arrhythmias or bursts of arrhythmias. Now, one of the things about these patients with defibrillators is since the defibrillators are, are pretty good overall of, of terminating these rhythms is that by the time they come to the ED, they're often not in the arrhythmia anymore because the defibrillator has um, gotten them out of the rhythm already. So that's the first thing that we would do. What we would find on, on the interrogation is it, it gives a, a recording of the electrical activity at the tip of the lead. 
And from that, we can make a more specific diagnosis of the arrhythmia, which um, I hopefully we'll get into. In terms of de de really dividing up um, or developing a framework of why is this happening now, it's really important to know exactly what that rhythm is because the pathways will go down to and the considerations will, will differ considerably. Um, and so what we'll wanna know is what is this monomorphic VT or is this polymorphic VT or, or its cousin ventricular fibrillation? Those each have two different differentials of why is this happening now? Why is this heating up and causing multiple episodes? Ventricular fibrillation is um, usually hemodynamically non-tolerated. And so that often is associated with the syncope. So that's a consideration here. Um, it is usually caused by something like profound electrolyte abnormalities, um, severe decompensated heart failure, a common one is active ischemia, um, and uh, other triggers include short coupled premature um, beats or inherited um, cardiomyopathies like Brugada or HCM, um, things like that. Whereas I want to contrast that with monomorphic VT, um, which is uh, often seen in people with structurally abnormal hearts due to scar tissue, fibrosis, we call that abnormal substrate, which can lead to fixed circuits and what we call re-entry, where it's a it's kind of a, a circular motion of elect electrical wavefront um, that where the wavefront, by the time it gets back to where it started, is recovered refractory and is continuing kind of an infinite loop. And that often leads to a very regular or monomorphic um, ventricular tachycardia. Um, so this person, this patient we know is already has a history of both VT and VF. So I guess both are, are fair game in this patient. Uh, we know he's been on amiodarone in the past. Um, uh, that, that was started, it sounds like, on his trip. So this has been a, an issue that's plaguing him. So hopefully we can help him. Um, so that's kind of what I have for, for so far on this. In for, on this. Um, any questions about that so far? Yeah. Hello. Actually, uh, sorry, friends, before you continue. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Question. How often do you uh, recommend ICD interrogation for a patient under this type of treatment? Gotcha. So. Um, ICD interrogation, taking a step back, what is an IT, ICD interrogation? How do we do it? Um, the, we take a special type of a laptop that um, is designed for this that has a little wand that can wirelessly pair with the computer inside the defibrillator, and it gives us all sorts of information. It gives us information on the battery life um, of the device, where it was implanted, and for what reason. Um, the current status of the leads, are they working um, correctly? Um, is Does the patient pace um, a lot? Is it a function as a pacemaker? Um, and how often does it do that? How is the device programmed to detect these arrhythmias? Um, and then what type of therapies do they give? There's two types of therapies a defibrillator can give for a fast heart rhythm. One is called anti-tachycardia pacing or ATP. That's when it overdrive paces the heart to try to break the short circuit of a reentered arrhythmia without having to painfully shock the patient. Um, we program those to try to customize to the patient because we really want to avoid shocks in these patients. Shocks are very, very painful. Can, they can be very traumatic. And then of course, they if, if, if those don't work, it delivers a, a, a shock. And so we can program the rate and how it recognizes these rhythms. Um, and it creates a store of the prior arrhythmias that the device has detected, whether it's um, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, or, or, or even atrial fibrillation. It can keep a log of those. If a patient is, to answer your, your question specifically, if the patient is coming in um, saying that they've had a discharge of their device, so they're saying they've had a shock, um, or they're um, saying they've been passing out, um, or if anyone's seen anything on an EKG or monitoring the word can be an arrhythmia, that is, um, that is all cause, um, that is all an indication for getting a device interrogation um, during this admission. And in this case, if they've had been having multiple therapies, um, I would do it um, urgently. So that should be done in the emergency room. And the, the way to do that is in, um, in some hospitals, it's by contacting the electrophysiology service and they'll either have the attending or, or a fellow do it themselves. Um, or one of their technicians. And in some hospitals, where if, if they don't have electrophysiology in-house, um, they can get a, a device representative from the manufacturer of the device who can pull that information and give it to the treating providers. Oh, thank you so much for this insight. Okay, friends, maybe we can go to the second other one. Yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you, Tim. So I'll 
I'll continue with my HPI. So in the emergency department, his divine interrogation showed three ATPs and two shots for monomorphic ventricular tachycardia in the 24 hours leading to the presentation, along with 14 additional ATPs and 13 appropriate ICD shocks in the previous week to the presentation. In the interview, besides the episodes of syncope, he denied feeling palpitations, dyspnea, weight gain, chest discomfort, or fatigue. His device was reprogrammed to give an additional ATP therapies, and he was admitted to the CCU after starting lidocaine and amylar infusions. And while in the CCU over the next 48 hours, he had 12 further ATP episodes and three appropriate ICD shocks. To expand a little bit um, more on his past medical history, so the patient had uh, was diagnosed in 2019 with uh, chronic heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, New York Heart Association class two, uh, his initial uh, echocardiogram show um, ejection fraction of 15%, and his last echocardiogram 2021 showed an ejection fraction of 28%. Uh, he was also diagnosed with Chagas induced dilated cardiomyopathy in 2019. Uh, and, and then he uh, had an ICD implant in 2020. Chagas was uh, diagnosed with antibody tests, and uh, at that point, doctors decided not to treat. Uh, this patient due to an elevated RASI score, which is a score that measures uh, his prognosis, um, unless the patient was later considered for transplant. On 2020, a patient was diagnosed with latent uh, tuberculosis for which he completed treatment with rifampicin for four months. And he also had an, an additional episode of ventricular fibrillation with appropriate shock to normal sinus rhythm on 2021. Uh, in addition, a uh, patient has a uh, hyperlipidemia, but he's not on statin due to abnormal LFTs. His medications and admissions, he was on guideline directed medical therapy with metropolis, spironolactone, torsemide. He was using Entresto uh, back in El Salvador. However, he was taken out there. Um, he, was, uh, he was an aspirin baby dose and amylar uh, load started on, um, on El Salvador. In terms of his family history, uh, his mother died of complications of hypertension. Uh, he doesn't have any uh, history of early uh, myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy, certain cardiac death in his family. In terms of social history, he's originally from El Salvador, uh, works in the kitchen of a hotel. He's a past drinker. Quit, he quit uh, 30 years ago, and he never has never smoked and denies drug use. He reports no allergies and has no uh, surgical history. In the, in the emergency department, so he was afebrile, heart rate was 63, uh, blood pressure was 104 over 64, respiratory rate was 18, OSATs were 99%. Um, his physical examination showed he was on no apparent distress, he was cooperative, uh, JVP was 12 centimeters, uh, there was no cyanosis on oral mucosa, uh, on cardiac evaluation, um, rate and rhythm were regular, normal S1 and S2, no more mores or gallops. Uh, pulmonary evaluation, there was no uh, on labor respiratory movement, clear lungs on auscultation, no crackles, wheezes, or ronchi. Abdomen was soft and non tender. Extremities were warm with trace feeding edema at the ankles bilaterally. Uh, distal pulses were palpable and symmetric, and the skin uh, it didn't show any uh, dry or it was dry, but uh, no rashes uh, found. He had a uh, baseline ECG in the emergency department, as you mentioned, um, and I'd like to show it to you so you can guide us through. Franz, be before we do the EKG, you gave an incredible amount of very valuable information there. Is it okay if I kind of think out yeah. loud as I look over this before we lose it on yeah, the screen? Yeah, definitely. Um, Please, do it. <laughs> so I, you you had given a nice preview that he had a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And then when you mentioned El Salvador, our, our, our kind of you know, spidey tingling senses should have gone off that, that this might have ended up being some uh, Chagas cardiomyopathy. So that's an, a critical piece of information um, about this patient and every facet of his current and future care. Um, and so we now know this guy has a history of Chagas cardiomyopathy, which is a chronic form of Chagas disease that um, it can, takes many years to form, um, but it can form a dilated cardiomyopathy and it can be very arrhythmogenic. Um, these patients can get a whole host of different um, arrhythmias. Um, so we, this is all kind of starting to make sense for him. Um, so we can talk more about Chagas as, as much as you guys want, um, but setting that aside right now. So he has Chagas cardiomyopathy. He's now having more and more episodes, even in the hospital, 
um, even on antiarrhythmic drugs of ventricular tachycardia, getting uh, and he used three shocks while he was in the in the CCU, um, plus other episodes of that anti tachycardia pacing. Um, so now we can say this is a patient with Chagas cardiomyopathy um, and VT storm. So VT storm being more than three episodes of sustained ventricular arrhythmias in less than 24 hours. It's somewhat of an arbitrary uh, diagnosis, but it portends um, a, a really challenging prognosis. It's really a kind of an EP emergency in these patients. Um, and th these can he keep heating up and they get more and more of these arrhythmias and, and potentially cardiac ar arrest. So it's a patient with Chagas cardiomyopathy in VT storm. And on the physical exam, what I, what I can kind of gather here is that his, he's hemodynamically stable at the moment at a current heart rate. So he's not in VT at the moment with a nice wide pulse pressure, 104 over 64. Um, and so that, may, that makes profound shock, a cardiogenic shock, a little less likely with, uh, without a very narrow pulse pressure. Um, but it does sound like he might be a little fluid overloaded despite him saying he wasn't short of breath um, by saying that his, his jugular venous pressure was a little bit elevated at, at 12. And so he's a patient with Chagas cardiomyopathy with some degree of heart failure now in, in, in VT storm. So that's, I think that's a, a, a nice frame to work with for now. Um, now I think it might be a good time to go to the EKG. Perfect. Yeah, before before I let I leave, I let friends go to the EKG. I have mm -hmm. another question at your time. Sure. Like you mentioned electrical storm. When you have a patient on electrical storm, what could be your algorithm or your diagnosis, mm. differential diagnosis on these kinds of patients? Absolutely. Um, so I I'll kind of divide it into 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 two things, and I'll keep it really practical. Um, for, uh, for you guys, for when you start to see these things, um, we'll talk about um, triage, um, and then and then treatment, and then workup. So um, triage is really important. These patients, they have ICDs, which are keeping them um, in back in, in in normal rhythm. They're maintaining sinus rhythm with their through their therapies for now. Um, if if these patients continue to get more and more shocks, they can get. Um, acidemic, um, they can get into cardiogenic shock. Eventually, those uh, those arrhythmias might get faster or or less tolerated, and the patient can get in worse cardiogenic shock or even have a cardiac arrest and, and die. So even even though um, they've had a couple episodes and they look okay in front of you right now, it's important to um, to be uh, to be very careful with these patients and, and triage them to a, a, a high level of care. And so when these patients come into the ED work with your electrophysiology contacts um, uh, or your consultants. And um, it's, it's very likely that you will triage these patients to the CCU. The CCU has a, the cardiac intensive care unit has a lot of resources to deal with these patients. They um, can uh, monitor hemodynamics closely. They can give intravenous antiarrhythmic drugs and potentially mechanical circulatory support if they do develop, develop shock. So the first thing is, tri is, is triage and then um, managing them uh, and, 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 and treating them, I like to think of this VT storm uh, with an analogy of how do you get a, a sustained fire? Um, fire requires fuel, oxygen, and a spark. And VT storm also requires um, three different things to, to make it kind of sustain itself and, and, and keep on happening over and over again. Um, it requires a fuel or, or, a, or a substrate. Um, so that's, that's part of the analogy. Um, requires oxygen. The analogy for that, uh, for, all that, for that, I will say, is enough sympathetic tone, adrenergic tone, you know, circulating catechols to, to really rev things up. And number three, um, it requires a spark. So every arrhythmia that you have requires a, a, a trigger. And that's typically an extra beat that's triggered by something like ischemia, decompensated heart failure, abnormal electrolytes, um, or just a piece of scar tissue that sometimes fires um, on its own. And so our treatment is gonna focus on trying to extinguish one of those pieces of, of, of the triangle, so to speak. So we can um, go after the substrate, which is the, the kind of the electrical, um, the, the scar tissue and the, with the certain electrical properties that can promote re-entrant um, arrhythmias. The reason I'm focusing on re-entry is because over 90% of these of arrhythmias, um, ventricular arrhythmias in these, in these patients with structural heart disease are um, re-entrant. Um, and so we can do that by giving antiarrhythmic drugs, um, such as amiodarone or lidocaine or procainamide, 
Um, you can also do um, catheter ablation to disrupt um, those circuits as well, um, which is where we bring the patients to the EP laboratory um, and we use catheters to uh, cauterize away those bits of scar tissue after we do certain maneuvers to identify where those are. In terms of going after the, the spark or the trigger for these things, well, you can treat the underlying cause, correct the electrolytes, um, treat active ischemia um, if they're having it, um, uh, or you can try to pace them faster that can try to suppress it, um, or you can give antiarrhythmic drugs, which can suppress um, ambient ectopy as well. And finally, one of the most interesting things, and it's an area of active research and innovation in the field is going after the autonomic modulation. And so that's the excess sympathetic tone, which increases the conduction velocity of electricity in the heart and really sets up the conditions for, for reentry to continue itself. And so we have therapies that can reduce sympathetic tone. Um, the simplest one is a beta blocker. So sometimes we'll actually give non-selective beta blockers like propranolol, which crosses the blood brain barrier. So it has both central and peripheral um, adrenergic um, blockade. Um, or we can try to act, actually get our anesthesia colleagues or, or pain teams to do a regional block of the cervical stellate ganglion, which is where um, the sympathetic fibers that eventually innervate the heart pass through. And so you can actually temporarily um, denervate the heart by injecting lidocaine or bucivacaine. So these are, are local anesthetics and that, that can try to, to break this. Um, and one of the points I wanna stress is that VT storm is a somewhat of a positive feedback loop that the every time you have VT, you get an increase in, in, in adrenergic tone, or you develop a little bit of cardiogenic shock and heart failure, which can cause this thing to self-perpetuate. So if we can break that cycle um, by going after one of those kind of three things, I said, the substrate, a trigger, or autonomic modulation, and if we can get them to go a period of time without having VT, often they'll cool off um, on their own and, and, and stabilize. Um, is, did that answer your question? Totally. Thank you so much. Now, I think we can go to the third aliquot. Yeah. Uh, so let me just show the EKG. Can you see my screen? Great. So this was the EKG on admission. Uh, I don't know if Tim, if you want to go over it. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, okay, so syst systematically reading this, um, I always start with what rhythm they're in. And thankfully, this patient is currently in sinus rhythm. We can see P waves before every QRS. They're upright. It leads two um, and one. So it looks like it's originating from the sinus node. Um, the PR interval, um, which is the AV conduction or the, the generally the amount of time it takes to get from the sinus node all the way through the AV node to the ventricle, um, is a little prolonged in this patient. And that's often true in patients with Chagas disease. Chagas disease patients can get both bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias. They can get sinus node dysfunction, which causes sinus bradycardia from fibrosis of the sinus node or they can get um, AV block or AV delay um, due to fibrosis of the, of the AV node in his Purkinje system. And so there's some evidence of that here with just the AV delay. Um, in terms of the um, other conduction characteristics, it's a wide QRS here. You can see that it's um, close to 200 milliseconds, maybe 180 to 200 milliseconds, the upper limit of normal being 100. So there's significant conduction um, delay already. And it's um, the patient actually has a bizarre axis. Um, on, the, on the frontal plane, if you look at the, the limb leads, it is negative in one, it's negative in two, it's negative in AVF. And so this is um, a, a really deviated axis. It's both got both leftward and rightward features. And in, in, in those circumstances, we call that a northwest axis. That is um, a very abnormal finding. And it shows a, a, a very abnormal um, sequence of activation in the, the ventricle. So couple that with the, how wide the QRS is and how fractionated the QRS is. If you look in leads V3, for example, you see all of these different little notches going up and down here. These me to believe there's significant electrical delay through the activation of the heart and significant um, amount of scar tissue. When we have a wide QRS, we often classify it as either a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block. 
this one really doesn't fit the pattern of either. It just looks to me like a ton of scar um, and uh, and delay. So between the abnormal axis, the wide QRS, the PR prolongation, the um, all the all the the, the notching, um, the lack of an R wave progression here. Um, the it, the besides V1 and maybe V2, it's it's really um, predominantly negative forces all the way V3 through V6. All suggests there's a significant amount of scar and maybe um, aneurysm um, in the in this ventricle, and so it's not surprising to me that this is the EKG of a patient who is in in BT storm. But thankfully, they're not in uh, in the arrhythmia in in this particular EKG for the patient's sake. Um, from a, an electrophysiologist's sake, selfishly, we actually love to see 12 lead EKGs of the VT itself. Um, because the the pattern of the VT that we can see, the 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 QRS morphologies can actually help us give us the zip code of where in the heart it's coming from. So if we want to go and do an ablation, it gives us a lot of valuable information of how to set up our procedure. Um, but sometimes you you and you only you only get what you get. And um, this patient's ICD has been keeping them um, in sinus rhythm between episodes, such that it doesn't sound like there was a 12 lead of the, of the EKG, or at least not one that you've, that you've, you've shown me yet. You have the sinus rhythm. He does have one PVC here, um, that you can see on the left side of the screen. The, the fourth beat is, um, an ectopic beat. Um, it, it's a, it's a PVC. When a PVC is positive in lead V1, um, that, tells you that the activation is going from um, back to front or left to right. The, the left ventricle is more posterior to the right ventricle. So it's some sort of left ventricular um, PVC. Um, and then the fact that it is negative in lead one um, that, that you can see there, it's kind of chopped off in the rest of the leads, tells you it's a little bit more lateral. And so there is a PVC here coming from the lateral left ventricle. Um, and so that could be a, a somewhat of a clue of, of where the arrhythmia is originating from, where PVCs don't often don't always correspond exactly to to where sustained ventricular arrhythmias come from. Um, so I think that's the some of the the highlights we can glean from this EKG. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. I have another question. <laughs> it's quite simple. You mentioned this that very weird or very. Uh, bizarre finding of a northwest axis. Are there some um, diseases or, or rather etiologies you may think about when you see that on EKG? Uh, sure. So the, the differential um, uh, or an abbreviated differential can be number one, um, abnormal lead placement. And so if you switch the leads on the heart, um, this happens more often than, than, you'd, than you'd think. Um, so you'd want to look back to see previous EKGs to whether she was consistent, or if you're in the ED, you confirm that it's appropriately um, hooked up. Um, but the, the fact that it, there's so many other abnormalities um, here leads me to believe it's probably real. Um, number two, significant rotation of the heart um, in, the, in the chest or congenital abnormalities. Um, can cause uh, a, a, a northwest or, or very abnormal um, axis and um, uh, significant amounts of scar tissue. So if the whole um, lateral part of the heart, so near, near, your, near your left arm, that, by the, that side of the lateral of the part of the left ventricle, if that part is very scarred down and the inferior wall of the heart is very scarred down, um, so lateral all the way down to inferior. If that's all scar tissue, that tissue is not going to generate electricity that participates in the generation of the QRS. And so all of the electricity is going to be kind of away from that area. And so that leads to predominantly negative deflections. And so lots of scar tissue in the lateral, infralateral, and inferior wall can lead to a northwest axis as well. Thank you so much. I think we can continue, friends. Of course, and it was incredible. Uh, so much you can tell from APG. It's amazing. <laughs> all right, so um, all right, so I'll continue with some of the labs that the patient had on on his admission. He got a CBC and basic metabolic panel showing mild normocytic anemia, uh, elevated BUN, uh, creatinine of one point eight from a baseline of one point two. Um, electrolytes were normal. LFTs were normal. He had a ProBNP, which was elevated with 3,469 from a baseline of 1,000. Proponents were negative times two. COVID test was negative. Um, no acute cardiopulmonary abnormality was found on the chest X-ray. Uh, 
and he also had a um, an echocardiogram on his admission was showing no pericardial effusion, but severe left ventricle dilation, systolic dysfunction, and uh, ejection pressure 27%, mild MR and mild TR. Any thoughts until now? I'm just, I'm just looking over what you guys are, are writing here. Um, so for the labs from an EP perspective, um, nothing too revealing. The magnesium is normal. The creatinine, um, I'm trying to figure out where that was. I don't, I don't remember was, you saying anything. That was totally, one, totally so out of whack. Yeah, um, so creatinine was 1.8, which was elevated uh, from his ba baseline. I see. Gotcha, gotcha. Perfect, yeah. thanks. Um, and then the um, chest x-ray. So th this is a, a, a learning point I always like to stress. Um, patients who are in decompensated heart failure or fluid overloaded can actually very often have normal chest x-rays, especially if it's a chronic finding. You might not see curly B lines or pleural effusions or parabronchial cuffing or big infiltrates um, in patients with chronic elevated filling pressures. Um, often they, they get often get um, chronically improved lymphatic drainage, which can make that x-ray look normal. Um, and then of course the echocardiogram there um, shows a, a, a significant cardiomyopathy um, with an ejection fraction less than 30%. So it's, that's, that's pretty severe with um, regional wall motion abnormalities. Patients with Chagas, since they get scar tissue um, put down in the heart, due to the process of um, both inflammatory and microvascular ischemia from the parasites and the inflammatory response um, creates a, 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 a fibrosis. Um, and that can actually even sometimes mimic ischemia or, or, or um, infarct, I should say. And so the, you'll often have parts, parts of the heart that don't move as well. You can even get aneurysms um, from this, this process as well. So that's a, a, that echo that you've described is, is pretty consistent with the, the history um, that you said. They don't have a significant valvular disease. And one nice thing that you mentioned or, 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 um, or didn't mention is that there isn't evidence of a big LV thrombus. These patients often get aneurysms and thrombus formation, which would make a potential VT ablation down the road if that was going to be the solution for his VT storm. Um, more difficult because if there's a big clot in the heart, we're pretty reluctant to put catheters in there and stir it up and potentially cause a stroke. Um, and then one thing I wanted to mention about the EKG is when I was giving you that differential diagnosis from the nor from the northwest axis, I should say that th that that was all relevant to the to sinus rhythm. Um, if a, a patient's in a tachyarrhythmia um, and you're trying to determine whether it's SVT or, or ventricular or monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, a northwest axis um, strongly favors ventricular um, tachycardia. So if we want to add, add that onto that list as well. Um, all right, so we now know that this patient has uh, a severe Chagas cardiomyopathy um, in VT storm um, who is in... Uh, um, decompensated heart failure. And now, we're, now we've seen some signs of end organ damage with the, the elevated creatinine. So I'm more worried about this patient. And this is the kind of patient that you would want in the CCU. You'd want to um, formally assess their hemodynamics and improve their, their heart failure while you're doing those things that I mentioned to try to quiet down the VT storm, give antiarrhythmic drugs, potentially do a stellate ganglion blockade, maybe even prepare for a VT ablation. Great. So um, that was a great overview. But I'd like to to uh, present some further um, exams that the patient had uh, previously that are pertinent to this case. So in terms of his prior cardiac testing, he also had a left heart catheter in 2019 showing normal coronary arteries, uh, mean radiatorial pressure of 11, uh, mean uh, pulmonary art artery pressure of uh, 41, uh, capillary wedge pressure of 27 and cardiac index of 2.5. He also had a cardiac MRI in 2021. And uh, I'd like to read the, the report, but I also like to uh, show you the, the image and then and then get some insights from you. So in terms of the, the findings, there was a normal left ventricle well thickness with severely dilated cavity and severe global hypokinesis, ejection fraction 20. 3% with apical aneurysm, subendocardial base uh, LGE in the basal lateral and inferior and mid uh, lateral walls, normal right ventricular cavity and pre wall motion. So 
I'll show um, the cardiac MRI. Here it is. So gotcha. So um, taking a step back is why do we get cardiac MRIs in these patients? Um, and so I, I imagine when he was having this this cardiomyopathy worked up. This was this was part of his his workup because. The cardiac MRI, more than echo, can can really look at the the features of the the heart muscle itself to try to give you insights on the the diagnosis of whether it looks like it's um, HCM or cardiac sarcoidosis or amyloidosis or other infiltrative diseases um, uh, like that, or whether is there scar tissue in an infarct pattern? Was there a, was there a missed MI um, or in this case uh, something like Chagas disease where you're looking for um, scar tissue for the, for the reasons that I mentioned. And so what this is, is the short axis view of the heart. So that's, if you imagine the heart like a strawberry, you're cutting the strawberry into kind of circular type slices from the tip back towards the, the stem. Um, the, these two slices are from somewhere in the middle of the heart because you see pieces of the papillary muscles. Those are those black things kind of floating in the middle of the circle. Um, on this, on screen left is the kind of crescent shaped RV. Um, and then you have the, the interventricular septum um, and then the rest of the LV. The LV in cross-section looks very, very circular. So my impression of what I see so far is that it, is, it, it looks like it's dilated. This, um, this should be a, a, a smaller circle. It really shouldn't be this wide. Um, and then the, um, Franz has helpfully put some arrow signs here on the screen as well, pointing at some brighter areas of the tissue. And so... Um, what I can infer is that you're showing um, the delayed um, gadolinium enhancement sequence, uh, looking for something called late gadolinium enhancement. So gadolinium is the contrast given during a cardiac MRI, which is taken up through the, um, the coronary arteries and then the ar small arterioles and capillaries um, all the way into the muscle of the heart. And um, it takes a certain amount of time to, to then wash away. And so this sequence has taken a number of minutes after that contrast injection. In areas where there is um, the scar and fibrosis, the, the gadolinium contrast will kind of hang up. Um, it's often poorly vascularized and there's collagen there that can kind of hold up the gadolinium um, and it will remain bright on the sequence. So anything that in the heart muscle here that looks bright um, is most likely scar tissue. And so what those arrows are pointing at is you see subendocardial LGE, where on the inner surface towards the blood pool inside of the heart, we see a rim of, of white or enhancement going all the way up from the anterolateral wall, kind of if you're looking at a clock face, like two o'clock in the clock, all the way down towards like six o'clock uh, or so. You see a significant amount of um, subendocardial. You see some black just outside of that, which could be... Um, relatively preserved or normal tissue. And then you see another rim of white. Sometimes the pericardium can be can show white, or this could be the epicardial of the surface also having scar in it. Um, and uh, kind of especially around three o'clock or so um, on the, the picture on the left. That this is all consistent with Chagas disease. Um, they can they have typically in the lateral wall of the heart, um, they will have scar tissue and it can be endocardial, it can be mid-myocardial, or it can be epicardial, or it can be even transmural. Um, we see all of those patterns in, in Chagas disease. The other thing you can see on MRI more easily than echo are kind of smaller focal aneurysms, which can be seen in Chagas as well. And so this is all um, very compatible with everything you've told us thus far. Patients with Chagas disease who are having um, ventricular arrhythmias, it's very common for them to have uh, late gadolinium enhancement on their MRI. And what this is helpful for is this helps us make sure if we're going in to do an ablation later that we're sampling all of these areas where there's scar tissue and allows us to kind of focus our procedures on that area and helps us um, have a better idea of which surfaces of the heart that we need to um, do the ablation on, whether it's the inside or the outside or both. And so this is a patient, if you were doing an ablation, you would need to take a look at um, both the inside and the outside of the heart. Great. Um, anyone has any questions or? Yeah, like I do have, but I think that we can advance to the next article because my next question will be definitely very um, 
related to that one. So let's go to the fifth article. Nice. All right. So, so thank you for walking us through the cardiac MRI. And uh, I think until this point, we can make a diagnosis, as you said, and uh, we can also go into the treatment. But I just would like to ask you, uh, what would be your approach to management of in, of this patient, and and if also if Chagas was relevant to your approach? Yeah, I think um, Chagas is definitely relevant. Um, uh, to the to the approach, um, especially if it ends up towards BT ablation, but also the prognosis of Chagas disease overall, um, it, it, when it gets to this point, is a somewhat guarded prognosis. And so, I um, you know we're we're electrophysiologists, we've got our little electrical kind of focus here, but we also can never forget about the big picture of this patient. Um, even if they get them through this BT ablation, this is kind of a sentinel event in this patient. And they should be potentially considered for um, for transplant or advanced therapies, um, or at least on the radar of the advanced heart failure teams um, for that. For um, Chagas disease in general, just I, I realize I haven't given a whole lot of background on Chagas disease, but um, Chagas um, disease um, has an acute phase and a chronic phase, and it's caused by the infection um, of an intracellular parasite um, called um, Trypanosoma cruz, um, cruzi, and it's uh, endemic to Latin American countries in both Central and South America. And it's, it's passed on through from the feces of a small bug, the red bug, bug, um, that can get into little cuts or scrapes and then lead to an acute infection, which is often like a flu-like illness, but um, it can, the, the intracellular parasites can persist and cause a type of chronic inflammation and microvascular ischemia that can lead to long-term sequelae typically of um, the heart as well as the esophagus and um, the colon. So you can get mega esophagus, you can get dilated uh, cardiomyopathy, you can get um, a dilated colon. And one of the unfortunate things about it is that by the time it gets to this chronic phase, we're having severe end organ damage um, treatment with um, antiparasitics often doesn't help. And so you're really kind of left managing the, uh, the, the patient it, it, it itself, unless they go to transplant, as, as, as Franz mentioned earlier. Um, and so for, for, the, for this patient, if he's already been on an antirhythmic drug and that has not worked and he's now in VT storm, we really need to be a little bit more definitive or start thinking about what we can do to be definitive to help this patient. What are our options? Um, there's conservative and invasive options. A conservative option would be to, after you stabilize this patient, um, whether it's with drugs or, or steli ganglion block or, or, or propranolol, um, you can add an additional antiarrhythmic drug. Um, but that has a pretty high failure rate and multiple antiarrhythmic drugs can often lead to long-term toxicities and need for close monitoring and drug-drug interactions. Um, so what is our other option is, uh, is VT ablation, which is um, not a cure, um, but can significantly reduce the burden of these arrhythmias in these patients. And it's a, it's a catheter-based procedure um, that involves us trying to find the, the, the centimeters or a few centimeters of tissue that are responsible for containing the abnormal circuit. And we, we ablate with radiofrequency energy to cauterize those areas um, away. And so that's certainly an area of interest of me, and I'm happy to get into the, the details of, of that as well. Yeah, I definitely have. My next question was absolutely uh, on that. For example, this patient that has Chagas, what type of approach would you choose when doing the catheter ablation? Because I have seen examples where, for example, in, in, in patients with um, prosthetic valves, a retrograde aortic approach is not possible or a traditional transeptal is not possible. What kind of approach would you use? Um, sure. So if we were to take this patient um, for a VT ablation, I think it's important to know um, what a VT ablation entails, and then I'll kind of get into how we make our make our choices. So a, a VT ablation is a, a long procedure. It's located in the EP lab, which looks a lot like a cath lab. There's an x-ray machine. It also has all of our electrical sampling machines, um, which allow us to make electrical maps of the heart and taste the heart and really control the electricity of the heart. It's a long procedure because we have to sample lots of different areas of the heart very, very carefully. And we often have to put the patient into ventricular tachycardia to um, get the most specific location of where it's done. So it requires 
a highly trained staff, nurses and technicians. It usually involves multiple operators, um, um, uh, procedural electrophysiologists to do the procedure. And we do it usually under general anesthesia for patients with structural heart disease like this, sometimes under, under just deep sedation, but can often take anywhere from four to eight or 10 hours to do the procedure. So that's why we often do it under general anesthesia. That takes a lot of planning. Um, it's really important to stabilize these patients and, and get their heart failure well addressed and their hemodynamics optimized because um, six to eight hours of general anesthesia with a patient with an EF of 15 to 25 or 30 percent can be really tricky to, to manage. Um, the anesthetic drugs that you that you give are often very cardiodepressive or they can um, they can make cardiogenic shock uh, worse for, for, for example. Um, we also we often give also give lots of fluids during the procedure through medicines and, and our catheters have have saline irrigation to keep them cool as well. And so we're giving lots of anesthesia and lots of fluids to patients with very weak hearts. So it really requires a team-based approach with the heart failure doctors, experienced anesthesiologists, because this is about of a kind of the highest stakes procedure that invasive complex ablation electrophysiology does. And so it's not something that you can kind of just flip a switch and do in the middle of the night um, or just kind of do it towards the end of the day. This is a, a big procedure, so it requires lots of preparation. And for that reason, we like to have as much information about the patient as we can before we do it of where we think we need to go. And that's where things like a 12 lead EKG of the ventricular tachycardia or something like a cardiac MRI showing where the scar tissue is becomes critically important. Now, um, Chagas disease is a really important disease um, historically for the field of ventricular tachycardia ablation because it was the doctors in Brazil uh, in the mid to late 1990s who were taking care of these patients um, who realized that just ablating the scar tissue on the inside of the heart was not sufficient to um, treat these patients um, as successfully as they wanted. There's a high uh, incidence of recurrences in patients where they were just using the catheters on the inside of the heart. Um, the the um, insight that they made is that the scar tissue on the outside of the heart and almost all Chagas disease patients needs to be taken, needs to be treated or ablated um, for, for a successful procedure. So they actually started going on the outside of the heart, which is not a trivial thing to get a catheter inside the pericardium on the outside of the heart, we call that epicardial access. You have to do an, um, you take a needle and and um, stick it under the rib cage directly into the pericardium surrounding the heart without fluid already being in there. A regular pericardiocentesis where you um, are, are draining a, a pericardial infusion, usually you have a few centimeters of fluid that you're tapping into that allows you to get in safely um, without damaging the heart um, underneath it. And so um, using skills that they learned from anesthesiologists doing epidural um, anesthesia, they applied those skills to getting into the pericardium um, with an acceptable complication rate and, and bleeding rate that allowed them to um, ablate the outside of the heart in Chagas disease patients with a much better result. And those techniques have now been, been learned for uh, by around the world for taking care of, of um, all sorts of other cardiomyopathies that have epicardial um, ventricular tachycardias as well. So that is to say that when planning this procedure, since this is the Chagas disease patient, we have to be prepared to go both the inside of the heart and the outside of the heart. So you know automatically it's gonna be a higher risk procedure. Um, the rates of, of, of cardiac injury or bleeding are higher when you have to go to the epicardial space. It's gonna be a longer procedure. So we'll take that into account. Um, it, this is an endocardial and epicardial ablation is typically done in a, in a, um, a, a tertiary medical center with an, with an experienced electrophysiologist. Um, who has a lot of experience um, doing that particular access technique. To get to the inside of the heart, um, the favored way that we do that at, at our institution is th through what's called transeptal access, where we advance catheters up the femoral vein into the right atrium of the heart. We then use a needle to make a puncture from the right atrium to the left atrium across the fossa ovalis. And, and so we advance our catheters into the left atrium that way. And then we curl them around and cross the mitral valve into the left ventricle. Um, that way we can avoid, avoid having to go into arteries um, so we can reduce the risk of, of cholesterol plaque embolism or bleeding from arteries. 
Um, however, uh, in, in, in some cases or in, in many institutions, they'll get into the left ventricle by going um, up the artery, up the, the retrograde, up the aorta, across the aortic valve into the left ventricle. And that allows you to have your catheters um, inside the heart. So for this particular patient, I would be prepared um, uh, to do both. Thank you for sharing that historical fact about the epicorial approach for beta ablation. It was interesting. Um, just to wrap up, I think on this case, uh, so as you said, the patient uh, was an electrical storm from monomorphic ventricular tachycardia in the setting of Shadows cardiomyopathy. The patient uh, had a right heart catheter. He was medically optimized, and then he was planned to have a catheter ablation. Um, and then uh, it, it was done under uh, epicardial and endocardial approach, as you, as you mentioned, uh, plus impella placement for left ventricular support. And he also underwent a satellite ganglion block. Gotcha. So that kind of really tied everything together there. So that that all that all makes sense to me. Um, you mentioned he had this done under impella support. Um, and for for those of you who might not have heard of that before, an impella is a, um, a percutaneous left ventricular assist device that is a catheter placed up the um, femoral artery all the way across the aortic valve into the heart. It acts as an extra heart pump to allow you to have extra cardiac um, output. And that's often done in, in cases where you expect it to be long, high degree of risk of hemodynamic decompensation um, from the case, whether it's from the anesthesia, the fluids given, or um, if you need to re repeatedly induce the ventricular tachycardia to get to the specific spot that, spot that you need to ablate. Um, having extra cardiac output from this device um, gives you an extra degree of control. We don't use those in every single VT ablation, but the ones that we expect to be especially complicated from a hemodynamic standpoint, um, the, then we're more likely to do it. So given his low EF um, and uh, um, the amount of VT he's been having, I think it's pretty reasonable to, to do. So I agree with that approach. This is amazing. Okay. Um, Thank you so much, friends and Dr. Meher. I have a quick question. Do you have like three teaching points, three takeaways from this case, Dr. Ben? Yeah, so I think kind of looking at the overall arc of everything we've discussed, um, number one, when a patient's coming in with um, uh, saying that they've had a, a, a shock from an ICD, you really need to... Um, plan on interrogating that device. And what you can learn from that device is the exact rhythm, whether it was an appropriate shock for VT or VF, an inappropriate shock from a device malfunction or SVT. Um, and it will, um, and so, so that's, that's learning, learning point number one is get that device um, interrogation. Uh, number two, VT storm um, is uh, an EP uh, emergency. It's, it can be somewhat of a slow burning um, emergency over a couple of days, but those patients need to be triaged carefully to the CCU. And then they need um, to, to have a plan to break the cycle of a VT storm by addressing uh, the substrate itself, the triggers or the autonomic modulation um, as, as we discussed. And number three, um, if for more definitive treatment of ventricular tachycardia, catheter ablation um, can be an effective way of doing that in a minimally invasive way, but just because it's minimally invasive doesn't mean that it's low risk. There's risk of, of, of hemodynamic decompensation um, in, in a prolonged procedure. Um, and if I can tack on a, a fourth one, Chagas disease is uh, a, a common cause of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy in, in um, Latin America that can lead to both bradyarrhythmias arrhythmias and tachy um, arrhythmias and often can lead to both endocardial and epicardial ventricular tachycardias. This is amazing, Dr. Jazz. Dr. Tim, sorry. And for the sake of time, Dr. Jazz, can you read some of your great teaching points that you could capture from this amazing electrophysiology class, please? Yes, for sure. Uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, thanks to um, Dr. Serpa for a great presentation and uh, Dr. Marr. Uh, it was tough keeping up because there were just so many teaching points uh, to capture. So I'm going to get started. Uh, initial uh, framework that Dr. Marr initially mentioned was if you have a patient that's coming in with some form of uh, syncope or arrhythmia, uh, 
you always want to check the ABC, uh, so airway, breathing, and circulation, check the vitals, make sure they're stabilized. <clears throat> Next thing you want to do is interrogate the IC, uh, IC, uh, the ICD device. So collect and examine it, look at the rhythm. Um, basically, you want to see if the rhythm is appropriate, inappropriate, or was this just a device malfunction? And then the third step is to obtain an EKG to examine the current rhythm. And then further quantify, is this monomorphic versus polymorphic VT, or is this ventricular fib uh, fibrillation? Um, some side pearls that Dr. Marr shared about monomorphic VT, that's usually likely from a, a structural insults to the heart muscle, so like a scar. Ventricular tachycardia and cardiomyopathy is usually monomorphic due to that scar-related scar re-entry. Um, polymorphic VT is usually like torsades de points, Brocada syndrome, long QT syndrome. And then uh, Chagas uh, cardiomyopathy can have a whole list of arrhythmias in the chronic setting, so tachyarrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias. Um, and then VT storm is something that I learned about today. I did not know about this term before that, uh, before today. And uh, basically, uh, it's the definition of it is three or more sustained episodes of VT during a 24 hour period. It could be either VT or um, ventricular fibrillation. Um, triage is important in these types of patients. Even if they have an ICD, they can still progress to cardiogenic shock pretty quickly. Treatment involves catheter ablation versus pharmacological management, and that includes like amiodarone or beta blockers for adrenergic blockade. Um, Propanolol was mentioned today, con considering it can also cross the uh, blood-brain barrier. And you also want to optimize reversible causes, uh, electrolytes, acid, acid base, and ischemia. Um, Dr. Marr pointed out on the EKG that a positive PVC in lead V1 can be a clue that, that this is an origin from the left ventricle compared to the right ventricle. Um, chronic heart failure on a, um, in a patient, even if they're decompensating, can have a normal chest x-ray due to the uh, long-term adaptation of venous drainage. In Northwest axis strongly suggests VT. Etiologies behind this axis could include scar tissue in the lateral to inferior wall, it can also happen in congenital heart disease or abnormal lead placement. Um, and then scar or fibrosis on an MRI presents with delayed gadolinium enhancement. And then the contrast basically stays in that fibrotic tissue, which will show up bright on the cardiac MRI. Then we had some teaching points on Chagas disease. The acute infection is usually like a flu-like symptoms whereas the chronic infection can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy, megacolon, megaesophagus, and the treatment with antiparasitic medication does not typically reverse the chronic infection complications. And then something that was pretty interesting that we learned today was uh, doctors in Brazil realized that ablating scar tissue just on the inside of the heart was not sufficient, and this prompted ablating scar tissue in the pericardium, which led to a higher success rate, and this is now being used for other types of cardiomyopathies. VT ablation, uh, not a cure, but can reduce arrhythmia burden, requires sampling of many areas in the heart. It's a pretty complicated and, and um, long procedure, and they, use a vo they try to evoke arrhythmias to localize the lesion. And it is a multidisciplinary team that usually uh, performs these procedures uh, with the EP team. Inter uh, so the last three were just uh, take home points. So interrogate the IC device when a patient comes in with arrhythmia. VT storm is an EP emergency. Um, that and you know catheter ablation is definitive treatment in some cases. And then Chagas disease is a common cause of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, leading to tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias. Thank that was you. an incredible, incredible summary. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaz and Dr. Mar, friends. Amazing. I wish we could have a longer conversation about electrophysiology because this is so, so, so much to take in. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our great Rafael Medina Specialty BMR today. Thank you so much. And I hope we can have more of you soon. Perfect. Thank you, appreciate team, the invitation. Thank you, CPE Solvers. Thank you, Franz. Thank you, everyone. Nice to meet you Thank all. Thank you.